it's important this stuff and it's not just about buying a property and the rising tide lifting all the boats mm. it's actually about figuring out this stuff you know writing a list of no's writing a list of yeses and then going for what's going to work for you longer term or partnering with someone that can do all of that for you G'day guys and welcome to the Pumps on Property show. Now, feeling epic this morning. We've just got out of the water, um, had an epic surf to start the day. Absolutely. It was so nice out there. It's really rare to get quiet waves up here on the Sunshine Coast, but fortunately it was just a few of us out on this one little bank. It was amazing. Um, what's been even better is Ryan from On Properties um, behind us today. We'll be doing some stuff with him later on, which is really exciting. Um, good to see him after almost a year in lockdown as well. So. I know. It's been so, so long, but yeah, really good to have him back up here and filming in paradise in, in actually our mum's backyard. She's just sold this property. <laughs> for an absolute bomb and I uh, thought we'd make the most of it before we can no longer film here. My mum, this is her fourth property now since I've been alive and everything she does absolutely turns to gold. Oh like, my God, she's just got such a good eye for finding that owner-occupier emotion. Yeah, and creating it too. Like if you can see the garden at this place, it's absolutely off the hook. It's so beautiful for the grandkids. So today's podcast is going to be um, the end of a series we've been on, which is um, really about selecting the right property. So this is the super, super granular stuff so that you can get not just a good property, but a great property and increase your potential rent returns as well as increase your potential capital gains longer term. So if you go back and look at some of the previous podcasts where we've talked about selecting the right market, selecting the right suburbs within those markets, and now we're going to be talking about selecting the right property. So this just, you know, a little bit of a blueprint to help you guys make sure that you avoid making some of those mistakes and hopefully get into a property that could be better than the average longer term. So the way that we've broken up today's podcast is really about some of the things that we think are positive about the right property and some of the rules that you want to follow. And then also some of the things that you should avoid that could potentially affect your long-term rent returns and capital gains as well. So starting with the big things that you want to avoid, I think you don't want to be buying anything that doesn't make sense for you and your family if you're earning great money long-term to want to live on. So no main road roads, no busy roads. Yeah, exactly. Like the way that we think about it is, would we want to live on this street? Would we want, would we be happy and feel safe with our kids playing out on that road? That can be something to kind of use as a rule of thumb. So yeah, avoid being on those busier routes where you might have bus routes coming down the street. You might have um, a bit of a thoroughfare or, you know, lots of traffic coming through. Just hopefully avoid those as best you possibly can. You know, we grew up in a street that was super, super quiet and then went on to an even quieter street. And so for me, that's the sort of vibe that I'm going for. I want a place that I can like skate on, play mm. tennis on. Um, my secret shame's rollerblading. <laughs> <laughs> Just got myself a pair of blades and I've been loving that at the moment. So like ripping around on the blades with the kids, getting some street hockey sticks going as well. Oh man, I remember like growing <laughs> up, Mighty Ducks was on the TV every other weekend with Ben watching it. You were just such a massive fan of the Mighty Ducks. Such a big fan. Like I was rollerblading the other day and I reckon I rollerblade better than I surf. Like I'm like, <laughs> so I'm like, how much time did I put in as a kid Jeez. rollerblading like hours and hours a day for like so many years yeah for sure now some of the other things that we like to avoid buying next to or you know really close to is cemeteries and schools where there's going to be lots of people around um, you really want to avoid being next to big sport complexes as well where there's you know saturday or sunday netball soccer or football directly on um, you know retail or commercial or industrial properties as well um, you know again like we just want to keep it owner occupied we want to be in streets filled with lots of mums and dads lots of nice properties that are well maintained yeah exactly and then some of the big ones that we look at for every single property that we're considering is obviously flood zones bushfire zones major easements across the block as well and you really want to make sure that you're avoid avoid buying near housing commission as well. 
You know, so in terms of breaking up some of those things, um, there's a free report that you can register for online called a dial before you dig. And before we even go and inspect a property for ourselves or clients, we always order one. That allows you to see the easements um, in terms of like sewer lines or water lines or major infrastructure under the ground, which can be really important for future development potential. Um, I also like to sort of get some checks from the council on properties around um, certifications if there's any unusual car parking or decks or carports just to make sure that stuff's legit I don't always do that um, but but often I will check that stuff out on like a more expensive property the epic thing is nowadays with technology being the way that it is and the world going online every single council has such an amazing platform that you can go on to basically type your property into or the property that you're thinking about purchasing and it'll spit out this huge report on you know potential flooding risks uh, potential um, development zones what am I trying to say there yeah like the zoning of the property as well <laughs> that's <laughs> um, you know a lot of the time we'll be buying in low density residential zones which is just your sort of cookie cutter simple site but sometimes there'll be an incredibly well priced property in a in a zone that you might be able to do a subdivision on or a townhouse on mm. or something higher and better use in the future maybe a granny flat or something like that so it's absolutely vital to double check that stuff which is why for ourselves and our clients we always get a certifier and a town planner as well as a builder to look at the sites for us before we buy as part of our standard due diligence just to protect ourselves and to know what's going on under the ground as well yeah we had a client matt from victoria that um, worked with us back in 2019 and, and picked up a property um, in the north side of Brisbane and we got it at an absolute steal, the property, and then when we got the town planner to do some checks on the property, it turns out that it was in a next generation zone where he was actually allowed to subdivide the block. So, um, you know, rare opportunities like that may come up. You know, it's pretty out of the ordinary when a real estate agent doesn't know about it, but, you know, always, always good to know. For sure. Now, in terms of housing commission, my rule's really, really simple when selecting the right property. You don't want housing commission directly next door or across the road, and you really don't want any more than about 5 to 10% housing commission in the street. Um, Ripe House is a company where you can get really, really good access to mm. housing commission maps for the suburb that you're looking at, and you'll be able to see the clusters of housing commission, and you really want to avoid those pockets of the suburb. Now, driving through the street and actually having a look at the property is so important when it comes to the housing commission side of things because sometimes it's not going to be the biggest deal maybe you know they actually do look after the property quite well but then you're going to know real quickly when you go through a street and there's some uh, rough rough houses on there they generally aren't going to look after the lawns there might be lots of cars in the front yard there might be loud music or noise and things like that so you really need to physically drive through the streets to get a bit of a better understanding because the property that I bought up here on the Sunshine Coast with my partner, the next door neighbour is, is a housing commission house. But when we went through there, we actually got to meet her and she's just a single mother who's got two older daughters that don't actually live at home anymore and she's going to be out of there within the next five years. So it's like sometimes it's a bit subjective and you've got to um, you know, actually drive through the street to get a better feel. I like that. Like the way that I invest now because I've made so many bloody mistakes is I'm very binary. So it's either a one or zero, but Simon's right. Like there is some subjectivity to it and some gut feel or some intuition. And based on your stages of, of an investor, you can make decisions either way. Um, the other thing about housing commission that we do is we pay for an annual subscription or a monthly subscription for RP data. And you can type the street address in, in the suburb, and then you can actually look through all of the properties mm. that have sold and who owns them and you know you're generally looking for owned by the state government or australian government or a local council and that's a good way of determining really really quickly what the percentages of housing commissions look like because in sydney in melbourne in brisbane in perth these cities are littered with little pockets of housing commission and it's not that it's a bad thing it's just that you want to you want to understand that and what effect it could have on your property long term for sure now the last thing that we like to understand about the property is the pockets of the suburb now this can be really really important the way that we do it is we'll print out a map of the suburb and we will then go on to realestate.com or rp data and have a look at the sales history and plot 
on that map where that sale was. So you can have a look, okay, where's the property address? How much did this sell for? You can use three different colors, one for around the median house price, one for above the median house price, and one for below the median house price. And you know, if you look at six to 12 months worth of sales history in the area, you're gonna get a pretty good understanding of where the quality pockets are in the suburb versus where the lower quality pockets within the suburb are as well. So it, as Ben was saying, you know, there's generally pockets in the area where you can understand. And for us, we like to buy in the middle to the high pocket, depending on the suburb, just because this is generally where the highest sales are. This is generally where more owner occupiers are gonna be based and just get a nicer feel in the area. Without a doubt. Now, like an example of this was a property that our parents bought. Um, when we were growing up, the second property that we lived in was a suburb called Engadine in South Sydney. Now, at the time, I remember them saying, shit, we've overpaid, it's feeling expensive. But what they overpaid for was a bigger block directly on the beach in a- On more the bush. <laughs> on the bush, sorry, on the bush. <laughs> I'm thinking about where we're at now. Um, like on the on the bush, um, in a cul-de-sac, surrounded by other more expensive homes, in a more expensive pocket of the suburb, walking distance to the bus, walking distance to a local school, only a few k's away from the train station, in a really, really, really good pocket. Now, they paid for the bigger home with the bigger deck, with the extra bedrooms, with the larger footprint, again, on the bigger block. And all of those things came together. So at the time, they could have gone for the cheaper option. And the cheaper option, on a main road might have only been 50k cheaper at that time now you like extended out what 20 odd years yeah. even more than that um what's happened even 25 years is that that cheaper cheaper suburb or cheaper property sorry on the main road might be worth 900k or a mil well i've got an exact example of this because the street that you're talking about my friend actually just bought on because awesome. it was all he could afford and he ended up paying nine hundred and eighty thousand dollars for a three bedroom two bathroom house on a, a 600 odd square meter block and our parents property today would be worth over 1.5 mil you know so that value gap like this is why simon and i are so on this stuff like all of these little things might not seem like much until you understand history and the way that we do and you've reviewed the market the way that we both have and you know i don't want to miss out on 500k like i'm not trying to be a property mogul i'm just trying to have a very small number of good quality properties that i hold for my life and hopefully pass one to each of my kids and as a result of that like each of the decisions that i make are important like mm. each time i mess up one of these decisions it takes me further from financial freedom it means that i extend how long i have to work doing work that i may or may not want to do and it affects the choices that i can make to spend time with people i care about my kids surf more do more meaningful work like this like it's important this stuff and it's not just about buying a property and the rising tide lifting all the boats mm. it's actually about figuring out this stuff you know writing a list of no's writing a list of yeses and then going for what's going to work for you longer term or partnering with someone that can do all of that for you i love that bro like you know you're spending the same amount of money you're holding it for the same amount of time why not try and do better than the average right yeah uh, but let's move on to some of the yeses. Now, these are relatively simple. And once again, it's just coming back to that owner-occupier feel. And, you know, you you sort of, I guess this is kind of trying to tackle the emotions. Fully. Of, of the, you know, the people that you may sell the property to in the future or the people that may buy the neighboring property next to where you bought. So, um, you know, first and foremost is the size of the block. Now, for us in Brisbane, we really like to be buying blocks that are at least 600 square meters, if not larger. Now, this isn't a silver bullet, but it is definitely something that we're trying to do. Yeah, um, you know, obviously, like Fred Harrison says, the power is in the land mm. and the bigger the block in the more premium location is going to result in the better longer term capital gain. It completely makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's why beach suburbs all the way across the east and west coast of Australia are worth so much more than non beach side suburbs. It's just it's a limited resource and the bigger blocks in those areas are the ones that have smashed the performance long term. Um, I personally now like to invest in flat blocks. Yeah, me too. Way lower, mate maintenance you don't have like the ongoing f costs of retaining walls like i've got a block in brisbane that's not flat um i just had to replace um a meter of retaining wall across half the property and it cost me bloody 20k <laughs> it's you so know what expensive. i mean it's expensive and it's an ongoing cost i've done it 
in the most expensive way so that I'll never have to replace it again in my lifetime and neither will my kids. But a lot of people cheap out and as a result of that, you know, end up costing themselves a shitload down the line. Yeah, it doesn't need to be flat like you throw on a level on there and it's completely <laughs> even, you know. A meter of fall is okay. A meter, a meter or two of fall is completely fine across a big block like that. But, you know, the flatter the better, no doubt about it. Uh, I like a nice big wide frontage as well because generally then you're going to have more parking availability out the front. Um, generally you get a little bit of side access as well so then you're appealing to the people that have boats or caravans or multiple cars, things like that and um, you know just have a little bit more room for improvement in the future as well. We like three bedroom or four bedroom homes. Um, I know there's a whole conversation about housing affordability in Australia which I agree with but I I believe the Australian dream after 2020 is back to the Australian dream, which yeah. is a good lifestyle surrounded by people you care about in a home that you can be proud of, that you can grow some fruit and veggies and a nice garden in. And so I'm a huge fan of like the three and four bedroom home, even five, like I'm looking to buy something in Southeast Brisbane at the moment personally, mm. um, or at some point over this year. And I'm gonna be going for probably a five bedroom joint because I can spend an extra 50K to buy that but by spending that 50K, I'll be getting at least 100, 150 bucks a week of extra rent out of it. Coming back to the housing affordability as well, so what we're gonna see moving forward is multi-generational housing as well. So you got more family members living under the same roof line. So if you've got a bigger house with more bedrooms, that's got maybe some separate living areas and things like that as well, then you're creating some affordable housing for, for these types of families as well, which I think is a huge hole in the market. For sure. Um, you know, Simon's got a note here about off-street parking, which I fully agree with. Um, cars are actually like so much cheaper now than they've ever been in the past. Like they are just extremely affordable. Access to credit is as low as it's ever been. And so there's a lot of people in Australia that have nice cars, maybe one, maybe two. Um, my ideal site has two undercover parks. Mm. It's not a deal breaker for me, um, but off street parking is extremely important as people like upgrade their lives in line with their dream. For sure. And, and as well, when it comes to the house, you want larger bedrooms as well because that's what the families want you don't want to be crammed into these tiny little harry potter bedrooms you want to be you know in nice big three by three square meter bedrooms ideally with some um some built-in wardrobes as well but once again you know these aren't deal breakers but if you're trying to get the best bang for your buck you really want to make sure you get all these things like i like properties personally now with an indoor outdoor living so i like when the kitchens dinings our frescoes roll onto a big deck mm. and then onto the backyard i think that is the market moving forward and you look at the plantations and the metricons and the gjs yeah. and the guys that are doing it the best they're the ones that are putting out these beautiful open plan living um you know another important point is to find a home that is the right size so you know 80 square meters is acceptable but very small for a three bedroom home um, 100 square meters is much nicer with potential to do something to it in the future now a lot of the new homes that you're seeing being built in the stocklands estates or mm. the whoever estates av jennings estates around australia um, people are building two 300 square meter homes these days so that's where the trend has been mm. going for a long time now yeah for sure so they're sort of the things that we like to look at when identifying properties and you know this is why it is really important to physically inspect a property before you're going to buy it physically drive through the street and the area before you buy it as well because sometimes you just don't know until you know you know i think um i'm a very very logical investor as a business we've got literally over 140 ones or zeros on each decision making point around the suburb around the market around the house that we follow but then i also massively follow my intuition and mm. my gut and my wife's even better at that than me like she's all about how does it feel and mm. because of that some of the decisions we've made in the last five years have been you know above average and i think it's very easy as an investor to be either too emotional or too logical and i think the right investor or the future of investing is when you can balance those things and buy with logic but also appeal to that owner occupied emotional person that's going to rent and sell to you or to them in the future for sure so thanks so much for listening guys really appreciate it i hope you got a little bit of value out of this if you've taken a few little notes for when you go out there and you're investing 
yourself, um, you know, maybe follow a few of these things to hopefully get a better result. You know, with this series, what we've tried to do is give you some of the behind the scenes things that makes the investments that we buy for ourselves these days a little bit better than what I was doing 10 years ago. Mm. And so, you know, go back and listen to the timing podcast, give a listen to how to identify the right market, the right suburb and the right property. And, and hopefully across those, you can sit down, you can write out some notes and a bit of a plan for yourself in terms of what you're going to focus on and target mm. moving forward and what you're going to leave behind. And as a result of that, we hope that you get much, much better returns in the future and properties that you can be proud of and stoked about in your portfolio. You know, the reason I've put this sort of stuff in place is because I made just so many mistakes with my own portfolio and it wasn't until I'd bought five or six properties that I was, I'd realized I'd bought on main roads, I'd bought next to housing commission, I'd bought places that were too small, I'd bought the cheap pockets of the suburbs or the wrong market at the wrong time and by learning those mistakes, like with the type of person I am, I started to create a process and a structure that would save me from making those mistakes in the future. So we're so grateful to have been able to share this with you guys and we hope that you can use this to your advantage, take advantage of current market conditions and do your best in the next few years thanks so much for listening guys and please share this with somebody who needs to hear it who's just about to get into the market themselves no doubt about it oh, sweaty. so sweaty